Welcome to the Planetsmith Devlog. We're making an open world survival crafting game set on procedurally generated planets. We already have creative mode working for the game, but it's finally time to start making survival mode. Today we're working on some core aspects of the game's survival mode, like breaking blocks through progress and storing them in the player's inventory. So, my to-do list for today looks like Add a nice little animation for the block breaking. Track the progress of the block being broken. Finally, update the player's inventory when a block is placed or broken. How hard can that be? Unsurprisingly, as with all things Planetsmith, it turned out to be a lot more complex and it required me to make a lot of decisions that will hopefully future-proof us when more features get added, like multiplayer. The first step was to create a breaking animation. I chose to use a 3D texture for this with 16 different stages of the block cracking. Because it's a 3D texture, I can change the Z value to smoothly interpolate between all the stages, giving us a smooth effect. Now comes the surprisingly tricky part. I need the mesh to the block that is being broken. The game obviously already knows how to create the mesh, as it's already been rendered. However, it's rendering a whole chunk, which is a complex mesh, with every block in the chunk connected, and with special UV coordinates to allow for all the game's textures. I just need one block. One way to do this would be to create a whole new function to do this. But this is a very, very bad idea. Mm. When coding, you want to reuse code as much as possible. This isn't just because programmers are lazy, which we are. This makes bugs much less likely and easier to fix. So, I need to be able to reuse the same meshing code as the chunks. That way, if there is a bug, I can fix it in one place. Or if I add a new block type, I only need to update the block meshing system and it'll work everywhere in the game. One way to achieve this would be to make the meshing system add each block individually. That way I can reuse the code directly. But there's a reason I don't do this, as this is a much slower process. So instead, I'm going to try and hijack the chunk meshing system and get it to mesh a one by one chunk. This is slightly tedious, but it's the best way to share code across the two functions. We don't want to make any compromises with chunk meshing, but a small amount of compromise for block breaking is fine. Now the block has the breaking texture, which is rendered on top whenever a block is being broken. And since it's using the same function that generates the terrain, it always lines up. Great, this works now. Blocks can break slower or faster depending on their material and eventually equipped tools. Another cool feature is this implementation allows for multiple blocks to be dug at once, something we will definitely need for multiplayer. Now, onto the inventory. We need that to update and collect dug blocks. Again, because of the job system, we need to resync with the main thread in order to update the player's inventory. To do this, I created a callback and a task which waits until the dig job is complete. Once it's complete, the callback fires and the player's inventory updates as expected. I mean, it updates as expected? Okay, this is funny. We're picking up rotated dirt that of course doesn't make sense. Let's fix that one last time. And it works! On to part two. Removing an item from the player's inventory when they place a block. Surely this one's easy. Nope. Because we can't interact with the blocks instantly, we have to wait for the job system 
whenever we place a block to find out if a placement was valid. This means we can't instantly remove it from the player's inventory as the placement could fail, either because the player was looking into the air or because the player is stood on top of the placement location. However, if we don't remove the block instantly from the player's inventory, they could be able to place blocks they don't have inside the same tick or cheese the system some other way like this. Unfortunately, I didn't consider this when I made the creative inventory. And of course, in creative, this doesn't matter. At the time, I was thinking more about optimization for chests and not the player's own inventory. So I made each inventory slot contain only data. This doesn't work because if the inventory slot is the container of the block data, it can't understand actions like a player changing the block slot while a block is being placed. If that happens when the block is confirmed on being placed, it will try to remove the wrong block from the player's inventory. Instead, I made another container called a stack. This means that blocks are no longer stored directly in a slot. They are stored inside a container called a stack, which can be placed inside an inventory slot. The stack can now be tracked when it moves and it can reserve blocks which are trying to be placed by the game. If the placement is successful, the reserved block is removed, but if it fails, it's returned to the inventory. This completely fixes the issue and will prevent any type of exploit from inventory changes after placing. To the player, of course, it still appears to happen instantly, but in reality, a block placement takes up to 50 milliseconds to take place, which could be a couple of frames. Okay, we can now have block breaking through progress and block placing with inventory updates, but we don't have a player inventory, just this nine slot hotbar. We have the creative inventory, but that isn't a proper inventory as it doesn't store blocks. It just provides an easy way to get access to all the blocks in the game. What we need now is to expand the player's inventory. For this, I'm planning something a little different. Instead of the player having an inventory by default, I want the inventories to be tied to backpacks. The items in a backpack will stay in the backpack if you take it off, meaning the player can have backpacks that are ready to go for different tasks. And this also feels like a great way we can reward the player by crafting better and more expensive backpacks which will have more inventory spaces or special features. We won't of course let you place a backpack inside a backpack to get backpack inception, but we will let the player place backpacks inside chests or on the floor. For now, for simplicity, we're going to tie a default backpack to the player, but this future plan will guide the way I'm making the user interface for the player's inventory. The first consideration we need to make is that we're going to have backpacks with different sizes. This means we need an inventory grid that can be resized. I can already feel it, the hexagons are here again to taunt me. With square or rectangular inventory slots, this would be a lot easier, but it's worth the extra effort to make this work with hexagons. Thankfully, the creative inventory already sorted parts of this problem. I already have a function that creates hexagonal grids for detecting which hexagon the mouse clicks, but sadly, it doesn't render the visuals. It's using a static image as the background. Now, I want to be able to take one hexagon and turn it into a hexagonal grid of any size. To do this in Unity, you can just extend the masked graphic class. 
to make your own UI graphic. To make sure everything lines up correctly, I'm first going to draw some gizmos for the editor that can show me the grid that the mouse clicks are using. Converting to hex coordinates is second nature to me now. All we have to do is convert the grid index for the hexagon into axial coordinates, then convert that into a real world position. We then just need to add an offset for each corner of the hexagon, which in axial coordinates is in multiples of one third. That's looking good. Next step, convert this into Unity's populate mesh function so I can draw the hexagon on screen. And voila! We have a cool hexagonal grid that can be any size we want, and it works as an inventory. This means that we can now handle bags or chests of any size and generate an inventory grid for them without having to create any custom UI for that inventory, saving us a ton of future work. These mechanics, while simple, really form the backbone for this kind of survival crafting. So it was important to get them sorted now before we run into any other issues later. That's it for now. Next episode, I will continue with how we handle blocks dropped onto the floor. Another simple problem that has required me to make a physics engine. I want to thank our members for all the support so far. Your support helps us create more content, which in turn grows our community. So you are a big reason we can continue to make PlanetSmith. As always, please wishlist PlanetSmith on Steam and join our Discord. It's becoming a really vibrant community and we'd really like you to join us. See you next time where we'll talk more about our burgeoning survival experience.